everybody at Homewood Old Guy Hi-Fi channel. Hope everyone's doing well today. Look what we've got. This beautiful Pioneer SX5580 from 1976. Now, all you Pioneer aficionados will say, wait a minute, Pioneer never made an SX5580. And they never made any of their products in 1976 in black. Well, in the U.S., that's true. But this is not a U.S. piece. The SX5580 is actually the same unit as the SX1050. However, the SX1050 was only available in silver and only available in 110 volts. Now, this unit was designed by Pioneer, from what I understand, to be sold to U.S. service personnel on the, from the base PX. So it is dual voltage and it's switchable on the back between 120 and 240. And they offered it in black when they didn't offer it in the U.S. in black and gave it a different model number to, to uh, differentiate it from the rest of the Pioneer line. So it's quite a beast. Now, one of the things that's nice about it is it is the same as the 1050. So specifications are exactly the same. It's 120 watts by two into eight ohms and 170 watts by two into four ohms. And also you can tell it is a really high current unit. Also the bandwidth on it is from seven Hertz to 90,000, which in its day was a very wide bandwidth, uh, especially power bandwidth. So really, really a great piece. Um, it has some really unique features, and we're going to go do a close-up on the front panel in just a minute, and then we'll spin it around and look at the goes into's and goes out is on the back. But it is just a beautiful piece. You know, the beautiful, well, the meters aren't power meters. It's just a signal strength and then a center tuning frequency meter for the tuner. Um, and that was a big deal. And speaking of the tuner, this unit has a real unique feature. And I've never heard of this before, but it might have been common in the day. But anyway, I got to read it to you, and it's actually from page three in the owner's manual. And I'm just going to read it verbatim. Anti-birdie filter suppresses beat interference. Insertion of an anti-birdie filter circuit between the detector output and the MPX or multiplexer stages prevents beat interference from a signal separated by 200 kilohertz from the desired station. This avoids various types of detrimental phenomena since the interfering signal does not enter the multiplexing stage. I have no idea what that means, <clears throat> but I suspect it has something to do with the tuner. Really what it is, is oftentimes when you have in a crowded area, especially like New York, big metropolitan areas, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, those kinds of places, you have FM stations or back in the day, you had FM stations that were pretty close to one another. And when they, it, they would interfere with each other, beat interference would make what the station you want to listen to kind of pulse in and out because it's receiving, the tuner's receiving two different signals at two different frequencies. And that's why that center tuning can be really important. But the multiplexing uh, uh, function filter actually eliminates that, that so-called beat interference. But I've never heard anything called an anti-birdie filter. So I really got a kick out of that one. Really cool. So anyway, we're going to do... Uh, a, Front panel, uh, look at it, uh, go through all the buttons, and we're going to spin it around and look at the back. And then later, I'm going to take the cover off, and we're going to look inside. And then we'll do that. So give me a minute to reset, and we'll be right back. So here we are at the front panel of the SX5580. Uh, and I apologize for the glare. The lights are uh, will cast a little bit of glare, because I don't know how to light stuff. And I should have my son do it, because he does it professionally. So anyway, power on and off, headphone jack. There is... Uh, Facilities for three speakers, A, B, and C. You can do A and B and A and C, but you can't do B and C. And then up here, I'm going to push a button. You'll see the light come on for speaker A, speaker B, speaker C. And then next to that, obviously, is a stereo indicator with the meters for signal strength and center tuning. Down here, we have two bass controls, one centered at 50 hertz and the other centered at 100 hertz, which is very, very close. It's only one octave apart. Um, and I think that's because of... Uh, Characteristics of speakers of the year, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Tone defeat, treble centered at 10 kilohertz and at 20 kilohertz. So there, that's a full octave apart as well. Then we have a 30 hertz filter, which is basically a subsonic filter for turntable use. An 8 kilohertz cut filter, which is to eliminate potential scratches and hiss, maybe from some tape decks that don't have Dolby or from FM broadcasts, which can carry uh, some noise in that bandwidth. Then we have a multi-path, which is 
When you have two radio stations close to one another and the signals are hitting your antenna just a short time apart, they can, it can cause a pulsing sound. And so this eliminates that multipath. And an FM muting just eliminates the static between stations. So let's move over here to the other side. And again, I apologize for the glare. Uh, I'm not very good at this, as you guys know. So then what we have here is we have our tape uh, control. So duplicate, that's on, which means it just sends whatever the source signal is. Tape monitor one and two. Okay, so we can monitor on tape one, monitor on tape two. Now adapter would be if we had an FM quad adapter or a quad adapter altogether, because there's a facility on the back for the FM quad adapter. Then we have our bandwidth AM, FM, Phono 1, Phono 2, and Phono 2 also doubles as a mic input. Then you have an auxiliary, and you can see the lights up above indicating what's what. Balance control, and then, of course, mode, stereo mono, and then the world-famous loudness button, boom, boom, and then a volume control, sorry, which is very, very smooth, nice detent, very, very smooth. And then this is a, a muting. It's a minus 20 dB mute, so if the phone rang, you could just hit that button and come back, and your volume control would be the same. So that's kind of a look at the front panel of the SX5580. And now with the help of a couple of Teamsters, I'm going to spin this thing around and we'll look at the backside. Okay, everybody, here we are looking at the back panel of the Pioneer SX5580. And you have Phono 1 and Ground, Phono 2 and Ground. Then you have an auxiliary input, which basically is the only non-labeled input. The others are tape deck one, tape deck two. And it's very common in the era. There's a DIN connector for the tape decks. It was very common for tape decks, reel-to-reel -reel machines, to have a single DIN connector, which carried both the record and the play signal. Uh, and it was just a simple one plug-in. Now there's an adapter in and out. And this can be used for EQs. It can be used for a lot of different sorts of adapters, uh, discrete four channel adapters, Adobe noise reduction outboard box in and out to put, apply Dolby to all your signals. And then down here we have our AM antenna, which of course is you know good old iron ferrite rod. So you have a separate AM and ground, and you have a 300 unbalanced or 75 ohm unbalanced, excuse me, 300 balanced or 75 ohm unbalanced like coax. Then here we have a main in pre-out, and that's different than the adapter, although you could put an adapter in there if you wanted to, or use just the preamplifier in this going to an outboard amp, or using just the amp uh, in this coming in from something else. And then we had the four-channel debt out. What that basically is, FM debt out, is basically, I apologize for the shakiness, is the, where you could put a four-channel quad FM adapter. Um, because this came out during the, you know, kind of the era of quad, but it's not a quad receiver, they gave you the option to do FM quad, which was really easier than anything else because uh, cassette decks couldn't do quad. A-track tapes could, but they sounded terrible. Reel to reel could, but you needed a really special machine. Uh, turntables could, but it was really expensive and very hard and didn't work actually any really very well at all. So there was a way to do it for FM. Then you'll see here, this is the voltage adapter, which makes this unit unique. Um, and, you know, sold in Europe, but it had both 240 and 120. Uh, and uh, so you could use it in Europe and then bring it home when you got, when you, your tour duty was over. Again, facilities for three different speaker systems. And then, of course, what I love is the AC uh, accessory outlets. So you could plug your tape deck in, your FM four-channel adapter, or your Dolby noise reduction adapter. And when you turn this unit on, it would turn on. One was switched and two were unswitched. So it would turn on whatever you had plugged into the switched uh, outlet. So that's that. I'm going to go ahead and pull back. We're going to reset and... Um, we're going to take a look inside and then we're going to do a summary on this. So bear with me. I'll be back in just a moment. I wanted to do real quick in the dark to show you. Kevin put a string of blue LEDs inside the chassis. Obviously they've redone the lamps for the front panel display, but doesn't that blue LED, doesn't that look amazing? Anyway, I wanted to show you that before we dug in. Okay. Here's a look inside the Pioneer SX 5580. As you can see, it's a beast. This is a huge potted toroidal transformer. And just to give you an idea, that's the size of my hand. This is the amplifier section. And if I can, I'm gonna try and zoom in for you so that you can see that there are uh, TO3 case and they're probably MOSFET power transistors. Now there's two 
or four transistors per side, per left channel, right cha left channel, right channel, uh, and they're in a Darlington configuration and a push pull. Now we'll pull back out here, and I apologize for the crazy zoomy stuff. As you can see, two huge 22,000 microfarad capacitors. That's what gives this thing the immense power reserve that it has. Now this is a low pass filter that's used for obviously the turntable circuit for subsonic usage. Most of this circuitry here is for the tuner and there's the tuner right in there. And then of course you can adjust the tuner and align it. Uh, this is actually the power regulation uh, part of the board. When, what you can't see, these capacitors are Elna capacitors and Elna is a super high quality brand still to this day. It's an outstanding product. But look at the board. There's no wires that are really visible. It is so well laid out and so well engineered that it's just amazing. And it's super clean on the inside, as you can see. Now, obviously there's a removable bottom uh, panel that you can get to other parts of the circuit board underneath this chassis. I'm not gonna do that. Uh, you can look up and see that uh, in the brochure online. I think that, that brochure is available in a couple different places to download. But it's just, what, it, what an absolute tour de force of engineering. No question about it, just immensely beautiful. So that's the inside of the SX5580. And we're gonna go back into the studio and we're gonna talk about sound quality and so forth. Well, as you can see, this thing is built to a standard. You just, it's amazing. And, especially, and not necessarily especially for its day, but Pioneer of, of the big three, Pioneer, Marantz, and Sansui, the most popular three, um, their build quality was exceptional. Actually, all of them had exceptional build quality, but you saw how cleanly laid out the interior of this amplifier was and the size of that toroid and the, the size of those capacitors. Now, Sansui did some really large capacitors. Everybody did some large capacitors, but I think in, in 76, Pioneer was reaching the absolute pinnacle. I mean, their engineering, their design, their uh, engineering and design philosophy uh, I think was they were at the top of their game for sure. And the interior of that shows it. Um, and also to sound quality. So let's talk about that. When this unit came out in 1976, if you consider what speakers were very popular in those days, most of them, Advent, Acoustic Research, KLH, uh, Epicure, uh, Utah, um, you know, uh, some JBL, but not necessarily JBL. A, a lot of those speakers were uh, sealed box acoustic suspension. And a sealed box uh, speaker doesn't have a lot of extension in the bass. And especially in those days, <clears throat> when woofer technology was not anywhere near what it is now, they had small voice coils, they didn't have a lot of excursion, they had pleated, doped pleated uh, cloth surrounds on the cones. The cone material was, the engineering that goes into cone materials today is far exceeds whatever engineering went into cone materials back in those days. And again, being sealed boxes, they didn't make a lot of base. And also, too, a lot of times they had, you know, rather, you know, rudimentary cone, little small cone speaker mid ranges, which could be kind of shouty. And then oftentimes they used a similar but smaller cone tweeter. Dome tweeters were just starting to come in and become more popular in, in and around this period. So, and I had a pair of Omega three ways, they were a 10 inch three way. And I think their 3 dB down point was probably 55 hertz or 50 hertz at the most. So Pioneer was genius in the way they voiced this amplifier. It's got a bit of a U shape to it. So, you know, enhanced bass, enhanced treble. Um, and again, that totally fits in and compensates for the shortcomings of speaker designs back in those days. Um, we've come so far in the engineering of speakers uh, that, you know, what was available then and what's available now is completely different. So they were genius in doing that, that mild U-shape uh, sonic character to it. And then, really genius, and as you saw, giving you t uh, tone controls at four different frequencies. So, you know, like on my old Omegas, you know, their F3 point was probably 50 hertz. Well, guess what? I can boost 50 hertz with this. On a small bookshelf, like a Baby Advent or something, they probably rolled off at 80, so now I got 100 hertz I can give it a little tweak at. And on the high end, again, you know, you get a shouty mid-range, you can cut back 10, 10 kilohertz a little bit, and that'll bring down the next octave down is 5,000 cycles. And then again, to try to get some extension, you could boost the, the uh, 10K or the 20K a little bit, and the next octave is 10K, but depending on the cue of the shape, and it's all laid out in the owner's manual, um, that could help 
maybe 15,000. I know my omegas didn't go beyond 15 or 16,000. So genius layout, absolute genius layout. And again, engineered, like these guys were absolutely top of the top of their game, state of the art. This was just amazing stuff. So how does it sound with modern speakers? Well, uh, I put the big energies on them and oh my gosh, these, it made so much bass. It was wonderful, very, very full sounding. Um, really nice on the top end, a little recessed in the mid range and the energies are a little recessed in the mid range to begin with. So not the best match, but not bad, very listenable. I put my little Warfies on there and of course, those things sound good on anything. And this had the power and the resolution to really make those sing. That was a great match. Um, I put the big ELAX on it and that was a very good match, although a little shouty on the top end. And that's a tendency of the ELAC a little bit. Um, I put the uh, Monitor Audio Silver 100s, not a great match. They're bright by nature. That's kind of their sonic signature because of the Metal Dome tweeter. This was just a little too much high frequency energy, but on the bass end, that eight inch woofer and the monitor audios, that sang. Wow, did that sound really good. Then I put them on the uh, uh, ELAC uh, debut reference uh, 62s, the DBR 62s that I have. It's new to the collection. And that sounded really good too. But the best combination probably was the Braun speakers from Germany. And I'm going to be doing reviews on all these speakers, just so you know. The Braun's are, an eight, it's a sealed box, larger than a standard bookshelf, but it's an eight inch three-way in a sealed box. So the, the bass boost on this was perfect. Now they can be a little bright on the top end. So I just gave them a little cut at 10 hertz, just minor. And it boy, did they sound great. And just terrific performance all around. Now, interestingly, in 1976, we didn't think about imaging or resolution or soundstage or any of that kind of stuff. What we wanted was we wanted to feel the music in our chest. We wanted the power. We wanted to play loud. I mean, that's just the, the time of, uh, of the, you know, the, the, how everybody enjoyed their music back in those days, especially, you know, rock and roll. You know, I put the Boston, the first Boston album on her, which is concurrent with this piece as, as far as release dates. And, oh my God, did that sound amazing. Um, on the ADS, it sounded amazing. It was, I was cranking it. My wife came down and told me to turn it down. But I put a good resolving speaker like the ELAC debut reference 6.2s on and the monitor audios. And again, I cut the monitor audios just a little bit. <clears throat> and this thing throws a huge image. Is it deep? Not maybe as deep as modern equipment. Um, and I fed the whole uh, the whole time I was feeding it from the Cambridge Audio MXN10 streamer DAC. So it was giving it a really good source. And it threw a nice soundstage. Good placement, good solid center image. Not a lot of depth, not a lot of getting outside the speakers unless the recording had some phase shifts in it on purpose, that kind of thing. But boy, did this thing perform. Um, it would hold its own against modern equipment. Without question, it would. Um, I'm so lucky to have to have the chance to play with this thing and, and listen to it. It's just remarkable. It is a marvel. It truly is. And, you know, it's Kevin at Skylabs, his product, and it's part of his secret stash. So if you win the lotto and you got a lot of money, maybe you could bribe him into parting with it. I don't know. But it, oh, it's a beauty. It really is. I'm so impressed. I'm so, really, it brought back nostalgia. Um, you know, I worked at Radio Shack in 1976, so we had big, powerful, realistic receivers, but we'd go over to Pacific Stereo on the other end of the mall and go listen to the Pioneers and stuff because that's what really sounded good. So it is quite a piece. Anyway, if you liked the video, please give me a thumbs up. I'd greatly appreciate it. And can I have a little heart to heart with you guys? 80% of the folks that watch my videos don't subscribe. And if you did subscribe, it would help the channel greatly because as I gain more subscribers, it gives me more credibility with manufacturers to get better products in for review and things like that. And that's really important, obviously, for the growth of the channel and hopefully maybe for, you know, not only your entertainment, but your information. So please, please subscribe. Also comment. Um, I love it when you comment. Anybody who's commented knows I respond to the comments. Um, I love hearing your stories. Did you ever have one of these? Did you ever know anybody that had one of these? Did you ever lust after one of these like I did? Share it in the comments. Let me know. Um, let every, all of us you know, know, you know what your experiences were. And also, if you have a playlist that you're willing to share <clears throat> on the community page, I'm going to put together a list of playlists. They'll be anonymous. Title, Coba, Spotify. And if, uh, I, if people have Amazon Music, put Am I'll put Amazon Music playlists in there, even though I don't use it. But I'd love to be able to share those playlists because... 
you know, the Spotify algorithm, the title algorithm is great, but it tends to push the stuff that they want to push. You know, artists pay additional promotional fees to get their music put up front and on screen. So sometimes the algorithm either can give you all the same stuff, like, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash ad nauseum, or it'll try to push on you the stuff that they're promoting. So if you have playlists that you really enjoy, share it with us and then we can all experience hopefully some new music and obviously listening to music is all, what's, what it's all about. So again, like, subscribe, comment, share your playlist. Uh, full disclosure, there are affiliate links in the description. If you were to buy something, I do make a very small commission, but it doesn't affect your purchase price and it doesn't affect your ability to return a product you're dissatisfied with. So again, thank you guys so very much for taking time to watch my videos. Um, you can't believe how grateful I am. It's First of all, it's a ton of fun for me. And based on some of the comments, it seems like everyone is enjoying it. So I'm very, very glad to be doing with it, doing it. So thanks so very much. Um, this is Ed Homewood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel, saying go listen to some music. Thanks so very much.